One of my colleagues said something which I appreciate. He said, the restaurant industry itself is like an elderly patient with pre-existing conditions. And COVID may have knocked them out, but they probably would have gotten knocked out anyway. Getting through this, uh, what are some of the immediate steps? Obviously, more realistic uh, rules on uh, indoor dining, maybe even plastic partitions. Again, nobody cares about aesthetics right now. They want safety. Uh, Aside from that, things like suspending the payroll tax, what are some of the immediate steps that can be taken? And then you've described that something is happening in this industry that really hadn't happened before. You're talking to each other in ways you never did before in terms of how do we go forward. And I'd be interested uh, when you get to that, some of the things like leasing uh, that you think will be changed in post-COVID. Uh, won't, we're not going to go back to what we had before, but some of the uh, changes you see coming. You're absolutely right. I think our, our, our industry is in many, many ways one of the most competitive industries anywhere. And yet, I, I think people who run restaurants and who cook in restaurants genuinely like each other a lot. And it's funny how... Unlike poets. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, It's funny how when you're on your feet, you don't hear each other as much as you hear each other when you're all on your knees. And we're we're all sort of dealing with the exact same crisis at the exact same time. And, And trying to figure out not only how do we get back open, but once we do reopen, how can we be a more thriving and sustainable business? Because frankly, even before COVID hit, this was an industry either because it was overbuilt um, uh, or, or just, you know, just the way, the way we do business wasn't working. And every single year, if, if, just to kind of simplify this for a minute, If you think about restaurants as being manufacturing plants attached to uh, expensive showrooms, and you say to yourself, well, that used to work pretty well because just the laws of supply and demand, there were a lot more people who wanted to dine there than, than there were manufacturing plants. But the manufacturing plants were always based in places you would never put a manufacturing plant, i.e. expensive real estate, right? Like the kitchen is the manufacturing plant. You would never put that, you know, on Park Avenue and Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue and Upper East Side and all over the way people do. But it worked out pretty well either because there was the right number of restaurants relative to the people who, who wanted to dine out or because the rents at that point were much more rational. And the whole rent scene, and and certainly in Manhattan, has gotten completely out of whack in the last 15 years. Some people say it's because there's a a bank and a drugstore in every corner, and that squeezed everything up. Some would say it's because of, you know, national chains that didn't used to exist. And national chains can often use Manhattan real estate as much as a marketing billboard, as much as a unit economic kind of play. But the other the other thing that has changed dramatically is is labor, which is that the cost of of hiring people in New York was significantly less, certainly back when I opened a restaurant like Union Square Cafe, than it is today. And so something has to give. And the, you know when the margins are smaller and smaller and smaller, and the people who work in restaurants can no longer afford to live in New York while they take this job. And furthermore, I might add, over the last 10 or 15 years, and this is a great thing, you know, when, Steve, when you first started falling in love with restaurants, it was Manhattan or nowhere. Now there's great restaurants in every borough, in every county of New Jersey and Connecticut and Pennsylvania and every city in the country. And so we're not just talking about the growth of restaurants in New York. So we have a crisis. And one of my colleagues said something which I appreciate. He said, the restaurant industry itself is like an elderly patient with pre-existing conditions. And COVID may have knocked them out, but they probably would have gotten knocked out anyway. And so, yes, we are looking at 
some structural changes. I think the compensation models in restaurants doesn't work. It's not sustainable. I think that um, some of the, we're going to have to come to terms with the underlying rent structure because if restaurants are making 5% margins and you're basically working for the landlord for 15 years and not paying back your investors, it, it's all going to come crashing down to, uh, to the bottom. Do you, do you think, uh, you know, obviously in New York, you're going to be in a better position with landlords because they want to get people back too now badly. Uh, what are there, are there discussion in the industry on new ways to negotiate leases or where they do better if you do better? Something where I think that's nurture what these things? Love. I think that's exactly what we'd all love, which is a percentage rent, which is basically that the rising tide lifts both of us. And guess what? When the tide is lower, restaurants cannot afford to keep paying full rent when the basis upon which that rent was negotiated, which was a very dense city of people who live here, people who come to their office every day, people who travel here for business, people who travel here for to go see a Broadway play or to go to an art museum. If, if the very basis upon which you negotiated your rent in the first place is now irrelevant, then something has to give. And so landlord didn't do anything wrong. They didn't ask for COVID any more than we did. But, you know, I don't also think that landlords want all these spaces vacant. Um, right. And so if there were a, a percentage mm -hmm. rent would be a really constructive way to look at this. And something whereby when business does come back, because I'm a big believer in New York to this day, this is this really weird place that draws no, no one ever came to New York because it was convenient or easy. They came here because they want to accomplish something. And I don't think that's going to change. I believe things well, I, 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 I wish uh, certain authorities would realize that uh, if you have uh, growing restaurants again, people will come back. Hello. <laughs> but getting to uh, another area, compensation, we alluded to earlier. The one reason you put in a no-tip policy was that there was a widening gap between uh, the front of the restaurant, you might say, the wait staff and kitchen staff, which also touched on uh, people of color who were more prevalent in the kitchen. And so there are some social problems building up here. Uh, you suspended uh, the tip thing uh, during the COVID crisis, but uh, how, how, how do you think the industry is going to uh, deal with that challenge? How, and by the way, one thing I hope these state authorities and feds do is this stupid law, this is me speaking, that you can't use tips for uh, kitchen staff. It's just got to be uh, the way. Right. So that, what can well, be that's, done to that's uh, the get, crux. get... Steve, that's the crux of the whole matter. Um, I came to the, to the decision to eliminate tipping in 2015, um, and we started to roll out that uh, we call it hospitality included, where our menu prices included everything. Today's menu prices include everything except paying uh, the people who deliver your food. Your, today's menu prices in most restaurants include the rent, the flowers, the linen, the food, the the cooks, the, the dishwashers, the reservationists. Um, and then we ask you separately to pay for the people who bring you your food um, and who clear your tables. And that's been going on forever. It's, it's a uniquely American tradition, tipping, and Americans love it. Um, some people love it because they love the feeling that they can punish bad service. Some people love well, it you because- you pointed out, if you don't like the service instead of taking it out on the tip side, just write a letter. Yeah, it's or an email. at the end of the day, management <laughs> is responsible. Um, you know, I don't tip my doctor. I don't tip the nurses at the doctor's office. I don't tip the flight attendant on an airplane. I, it's, I expect, expect people to do their job and to do it because they like taking care of me, not because they've got their hand out in two hours when I'm done with my meal. So we did eliminate tipping, and we eliminated it uh, primarily because – Every single year I had been a restaurateur, this goes now back to 1985, menu prices have only gone in one direction, and that's up. And if a tip is nothing more than a multiplier of the menu price, um, the good news is for tipped employees, they're making more money. But the bad news is that 
uh, in a state like New York, and there's there's still a couple states like this, um, kind of in a convoluted way, it's illegal to have tips shared amongst everybody in the restaurant. Waiters can share tips with other waiters. In fact, in most fine dining restaurants, when you leave a 20% tip, that goes into a tip pool that is shared amongst anyone who spends, quote unquote, 80% of their time in a guest facing role. If you spent 79% of your time in a guest facing role, um, which is crazy, I don't know who's measuring these things, uh, the restaurant can be the subject of a class action lawsuit if, if they were to ask tips to be shared. So what I would love to believe is that um, tips in and of themselves are problematic if they cannot be shared because it means that the front of the house, and I heard you point this out earlier, is typically uh, much more white and the back of the house that is not allowed to share tips is typically uh, people of color in a, in a greater percentage. And if, if, if we can just get New York State uh, to do what so many other states have done, which is to say, let's get rid of this notion of front of the house and back of the house, and let's put in a new, this is what I'd love to see happen, something I've seen in, 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 uh, from a restaurateur who I have a lot of respect for on the West Coast, a new paradigm called heart of the house. And when Steve Forbes comes to the restaurant, there's a line on the bottom of the check that says gratitude, which means thank you. And if Steve decides he would like to say thank you, he can put a dollar amount there, knowing that that will be shared amongst all hourly workers who made the meal happen. And I would argue that the cook who made your risotto did just as much work, maybe perspired even more than the person who brought it to your table. <laughs> Taking right. nothing away from the role of hospitality. I, I, I wanna see everybody thrive. Mm -hmm.